So it's Greek Tuesday and I thought maybe we would just enjoy some of the weather outside and sit out and talk, but I also want to make mention a little bit about the most recent video and some of the feedback uh, online, uh, especially in the comments that this is all about instruments, this is all about style, this is all about the worship wars. And I just want to point your attention to, uh, if you think that the most recent video was about worship, you need to go back and watch the most recent video again. It's not about worship. While I do have very certain and clear views about what is good for the divine service, that's not the main issue going on here. This is an issue of law and gospel. This is an issue of moralistic therapeutic deism, and this is a question of the first article, I Believe in God the Father Almighty, the article about creation. And under this article about creation comes uh, what we can know as humans about education. And the question I am truly asking about the National Youth Gathering is, is this the best way to educate youth on the future of what it means to be a Lutheran in this world? You can disagree if you like. This is the time to be honest with each other, to come forward, to talk. And if we find our disagreements are so great that we cannot stand to be in the same church with each other, then we should listen, I think, to the great Dr. Herman Sasse, who points out, it is far more godly for a Baptist and a Lutheran to agree that they disagree and not practice communion fellowship with each other than it is for them to pretend there is no difference and to force the unity where there is none. Now, do we have Baptists in the Missouri Synod? Ooh, you might be surprised, but uh, the real issue which we're facing, I would point you to an excellent paper written by Pastor Heath Curtis. You can find it on Scribd. It's called Liturgy as Beacon for the Elect, and it pinpoints that the entire debate, everything that we're arguing about in the Missouri Synod, which has kept us from the mission of the church, is because we disagree with what the doctrine of election is and how it is applied to mission. That's why we're arguing. We want to do mission. Both sides, confessionals and... Mm, Progressives, can I call them? But we can't do the same mission because one believes the mission is done under the doctrine of election. The other one is uh, perhaps leaning towards a semi-Pelagian, man-influenced mission. How can I explain this? Do you believe that by changing the worship style at your church, you will be more effective at making disciples and reaching the lost? If the answer is yes, then you disagree with the doctrine of election as confessed in the Lutheran confessions. What this means is that you're not a confessional Lutheran, and therefore you probably don't want to be in a church body that wants to be confessionally Lutheran. Is the Missouri Synod that kind of church body? Well, historically, certainly we are. Uh, are we today? That's what we need to figure out, isn't it? We need to talk. So I would encourage all of you who now hate me because of the video in which I question whether or not we are teaching our children moralistic therapeutic deism and whether this is good for them, not to see this as an attack, but as an attempt to get this conversation going and to talk about the things that really matter. Because frankly, I'm not against guitars. I'm not against drums. This is not about music. It's not. But confessional Lutherans are not trying to capture a moment in time. We are trying to hold fast to the word of God which has been given to us. And we believe it can be known and held true. It doesn't change. Even when it's translated into styles and cultures, it doesn't change. The problem we've observed, the problem the confessionals are upset about, the reason why we quote law and gospel so incessantly is because we believe that the mission of those who are not clinging to the doctrine of election as firmly as it is written has in fact obscured and changed the words. Anyway, this is the debate we need to have. But let's get into Greek Tuesday. Uh, you know, if you don't like me, if you don't like these videos, go watch them. You know what? I'm not forcing you to watch this. The people who are watching it, they care about law and gospel more than anything else. And you, please keep watching. This is great. This is a good thing. It's a building of unity. It's a way for those of us who want a authentic Lutheran ethos for the future of our churches and for our children's churches to continue to unite, to discuss, to debate, and so forth. I would encourage those of you who are watching on Facebook, by the way, to start putting some of your comments on the YouTube page instead. This is good because it is a more universal place. On Facebook, only those who are your friends and my friends get to see what's said. On YouTube, it's for the world. These videos are for the world. Why? Because at the heart of these videos is the goal to proclaim law and gospel. Our text for this week is Luke chapter 12, verses 22 to 34, with the option to add verses 35 to 40, which are pretty sweet, although pretty intensely law as well. But if you love the law, then it's kind of sweet law. But this week's text flows right out of last week's text on that parable of the rich fool, in which we learn that greed is bad, it's deadly, it will destroy you. This week's text begins, then, with a therefore. Jesus comes and he points out this tremendous danger to your faith, which exists in the material world and all the cares and trials and struggles which you are bound to face in a cursed planet full of thorns and thistles and pain and tears and all the rest. And, in order to counteract this, he gives you a promise. One of the easy mistakes to make with this text, and I bet you anything it gets made in the Missouri Synod this week, 
think ahead is to take these next words that Jesus speaks and to make them into a law and to try to tell the people how they need to go and achieve the promise which Jesus is giving. Do not be anxious about your life, Jesus says. It's so easy to hear that as something that you need to do, doesn't it? I mean, he's telling you, you do not be anxious about your life. But it's important to understand, Jesus is not giving you a command. He is not telling you how you have to be in order to be his disciple. What he is doing is he is promising you that there is no reason to be anxious. Granted, you're going to be. You're a sinner. You're a human. However, you have no need to be anxious. All of your anxiousness is the, the relic of your flesh which still clings to you. But what you will eat, what your body will wear, what you will put on, this is not what true life is about. Life is more than food. The body is more than clothing. And so he points to the ravens. And they don't work to get their food. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't store it up. They don't go to Costco. And yet they have all the food they could possibly need. They fly around. They pick it up every day. God feeds them. Give us this day our daily bread. Hey, did he just talk about that? And how much more valuable are you than birds? Now, this is not a statement that you shouldn't go to the store and buy your food and expect it to show up on your door. This is a promise. You don't need to worry about how am I going to do this 10 years from now? Where are we going to be next week? Jesus gives you promise. God provides. He's your father. He has your interest in mind. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your span of life? The word is actually a pecoon or a cubit, kind of a measuring amount. By worrying, by preparing, by doing all that you can to stay healthy, to eat right, to store up treasure, can you in fact add even an instant to your life? If God decides, as God decides, the answer is no. Now, in today's age with health care and retirement plans, we sure have deceived ourselves into thinking we can't. The reality is that you can be a lazy glutton, do nothing, and fall into money late in life. And you can work your rear end off and fall into debt late in life. This is not a statement to be stupid and foolish and just cast care to the wind, but it is a statement, a promise, that Jesus has your back. Consider the lilies of the field. They do not toil or spin. And if God is going to take care of the grass, is here today and tomorrow is dead, chopped up, and thrown into the fire, or in my case, into the street, how much more is he going to take care of your needs? So that he can say you do not need to worry about what you eat or drink. And yes, you're going to, but then you don't have to. You try to make this a command, and let me tell you, you will destroy your own conscience. Rather, you need to hear it for the promise that it is. Again, Jesus got your back. This is not prosperity. This is not health, wealth, and wellness. This is not victorious living. Most days are going to be bad hair days. But your daily bread, what you need, is going to be taken care of by your Lord. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. So seek his kingdom, and all of these things will be added to you as well. Hey, that sounds a lot like, and the rest will be taken care of. Yes, you got to get up and work, but don't think for a minute that by adding stress to that work, you're creating more. Sounds like mission. Fear not, little flock. Not a command, a promise. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Justification by grace. Not just eternally, but now, daily. Everything that you receive, pure gift. If you were to sell everything you have and give to the needy, you would still be provided for. Knowing this, go get the thing you need that will never wear out. Get a money bag that never fades. Get a lockbox that can never be broken into. Get gold that never tarnishes. Get the truth that no thief can steal and no moth can destroy. For where your treasure is, there you are. What's he talking about? He's talking about these very promises. Let no one steal from you the gospel, the heart and core that it is by grace alone. It is gift. It is promise. When you come to a text like this, it's not about you. It's about Christ for you. So when he does give some law here in verse 35, it says, stay dressed, be ready for action. And the Greek really means, gird up your loins. Be like men waiting for the master of a wedding feast to come out of the wedding hall. Blessed are those servants. He will say to them, more promise. Sit at the table. I'm going to feed you. Blessed are the people looking for that. Blessed is faith which needs law and gospel, the God honest truth, and the salve of consciences from now into eternity forever for the sake of the cross of Jesus Christ. See you Friday.